So we will record and we will do go back to our tutorial. Uh, what is it? No. No, yeah, I don't have the tutorials, so let's open it. So we started doing this tutorial and um, we can't really program everything um, by kind of, a, uh, by me giving you kind of small tasks and we programming it. But what I would like you to do is I would like you to program with me an imperative version of the checks, okay? So I did some, um, I've already did some implementations which we're gonna review uh, in a moment. But what we will do now, we will kind of try to implement uh, an imperative validation check for our student and see how it will look like, okay? Uh, okay, maybe I use code. So, Let's see. Can you read it? Is it legible? Zoom one, sorry. So let's zoom it a little bit. Okay. Um, and then uh, what we have, we have a number of, let, let's imagine that we have a number of validation classes, right? So the, the task is we have to, we will have an ID. Let's do it as a comment such that the ID doesn't complain too much. Okay, so we have an ID and this one is a number. Uh, we have a name and surname and they are both strings, string and it has to be at least two characters capitalized and only letters. And then this one is the same, the same as above, but four cars limit. And then we have um, H and H must be a number uh, in a range. This one needs to be unique, but unique we don't do for now because we have to have a database reference to check what we already have, right? So we sort of ha we have to do it, but we're not doing it now. So we're only doing the uh, the validation for those things. So let's imagine that we have to do the validation and we would do it in some sort of imperative programming language. So what we would do is we probably would have a couple of functions. Uh, so we would have a function is like, uh, valid ID, and then we would pass a string. Uh, this is a pseudocode, so let's continue with the comments, okay? So I will have, uh, let's kind of use go, go length, for example. Okay, let's use Haskell. We don't want to be playing with the, with the syntax so much, so we get confused. So let's use Haskell, but let's kind of try to think like uh, in terms of um, imperative programming. So we would have a function like valid ID, which would take our string, right? So it would take a string um, and it would return a bool telling us, is that a valid ID, right? Uh, and then we would have the same for a valid name uh, and then valid name would take, so this function is quite easy, valid name. So let's say, because we're using Haskell, we can close this because it should, Undefined, then valid name. Uh, valid name is the same. It takes a string and it gives us a bool. And then a valid name has a couple of things to do. So valid name uh, takes the string as an argument. And then we have to do a couple of things. So we have to check if, um, if it is at least uh, two characters, right? So we have to say um, if length of string is more or equal to, then we good, right? Else we not good. So maybe we convert it again and we say, if it's less than two, then false, else we are good, okay? So then we would say, else 
and then we have to do the other check. So we, we've checked this. Uh, then we have to check is capitalized. So let's imagine that we have a function uh, is upper, which Haskell actually has. Um, so we check is upper um, head of string. Then we good. But you see the pattern, like it would be nice to have the false first such that we can quit and then do the, um, the true path afterwards, right? So we say if is upper, if not is upper. Um, so we'd say something like this, then we say it's false. Otherwise we good, right? Um, so we need at if, if blah, blah, blah then it's not good, otherwise we good. Uh, syntax wrong. Else we good. So then we need to check, what else we need to check if all the letters are, um, if all the characters are letters, correct? So then again, we want to turn it around and we want to say no. So first, so we will say if uh, if any of the characters um, is so not this letter or our string, then, then false, else, else we are good. Is that correct? Pseudo code, the, the syntax doesn't have to be perfect, but we have to check if it is a string. Yes, it is a string because we're passing it as a string. We have to check if there is at least two. We did that, uh, if it's capitalized, uh, we did that, and if it's only letters, we did that, and then we say true. So we've done that. And this code is quite ugly already, right? So we have kind of a one, two, three level of nesting of our ifs. Um, it's kind of a, the complexity of analyzing, like what is true, what is false. Is, even though we try to make it kind of uh, simple for us that we have this exit kind of first, it's still a little bit ugly. And then you also see a very clear pattern that we're doing something and then we we shortcut to, to false, like we jump saying, oh, quit this shit, like it's false um, for every single thing that we do. So there is a certain repetitive pattern here, right? We kind of doing copy and paste and this copy and paste says, if something doesn't work, uh, return false. If something doesn't work, return false. If something doesn't work, return false, right? So in imperative programming, and especially in Golang, you often see this, right? And it's like annoying, like you have to type those ifs and say, oh yeah, if I have an error, return an error, right? Return an error, return an error. And usually your signature is like, you return something or the error, and then you have those checks for every little thing that you do. Um, in, 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 Haskell, we have these indentations because we do those if else uh, with indentations. In Golang, you have it kind of if true, then do this, else do this, and then you can kind of um, skip the else part if your if part is the exit. So in Golang, what we usually do is say, do this. If there was an error, return an error. And then we don't have else close because else is like, yeah, the, the, the if didn't work, right? So then you say, do the rest. Right. Um, so this is a very typical pattern for uh, this kind of a shortcut. And in Rust, you would kind of achieve. Uh, yeah. So, so let, let's let's not talk about Rust yet. Okay. So here we already see that this is somewhat repetitive and somewhat um, uh, ugly. And it would be the same for valid surname. And now, because in for valid surname, we kind of need to do. Uh, it takes string and returns bool again. Uh, we would kind of need to repeat, pretty much just do copy and paste of all of this and replace just this one number, right? So 
every time you have to do copy and paste of a whole method or whole function, you know, yeah, there must be a better way, right? So we probably should um, abstract what we're doing here to a function, parameterize it by, by the number, and then use this function here and use this function here, right? So we can kind of uh, make the code more modular by copying that into its own function with a parameter two and, and string, right? Because we need to compare two things, which returns bool, and then use this function here and here, right? I'm not gonna do this because we just doing kind of conceptually how it would look like. We don't necessarily want to write code like this, right? So at the end of the day, I will have valid surname. I will have a valid, um, what was the other thing? H. So I will have those. Um, so for valid age, uh, the signature is already more interesting because we kind of need to return the actual age. And if it didn't work, we have to say it didn't work, right? So in, in here, we already have to do kind of uh, parsing the string into a number that may not work. So then we may not have anything to return, right? So like, you know, I could say we return a tuple, we return an int and a bool, but you know, if bool is false, there is no int. So then we would have to return like a default value. Yeah. yeah. We could return at some sort of a age which doesn't make sense. Like uh, we could pick minus one, for example, and in C usually you do that. Um, because we're doing a pseudocode in Haskell, yeah, exactly. Then the, the 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 best way to do that is just to return maybe int, right? Because if there is no int, we just return nothing. And the, the caller will know, okay, the parsing failed, right? It didn't work. And if we return an int, that the caller will know, oh yeah, it worked. So we would kind of have like this, right? Again, I'm not gonna implement it. it it's not the point here. It would kind of look a little bit like this. We would do the parse maybe. If the parse maybe worked, then we would use the number and check if it's within the range because here we also have to pass the range, right? So int, int, we're passing the range. And then if, if the int worked and it was within the range, it would work. You can imagine that the code would kind of look similar to this, right? Okay, so then at the end of the day, you would have this kind of a new student function. New student function, student. And this function would take a string and would take, uh, it would not take the range because the range is kind of a hard coded like so, but we could pass it. We could pass the range uh, for the age, uh, but all those rules, this number two and the range, we let's assume that those things are hard coded, right? So maybe it's hard coded and we don't even pass it, okay? Um, it's part of the domain, it's not gonna change and we decided to hard code this. Um, and then it would return again. If everything worked, it would return a student, but if it didn't work, it would return nothing, right? Uh, so we would say maybe student. And here we would say this, um, we would say new student equals, and we passing the string. And then we would say, um, if um, valid name, uh, yep, so first of all, we have to say, uh, so we would have to kind of work with do, otherwise we cannot type sequential code. It's a little bit awkward in Haskell, so let's use do, uh, and then we can type sequential code. So it's say let, uh, params equal words from a uh, string. Before we can do that, we also would have to say uh, if uh, if length of string is less less than four, we don't have enough tokens for ID, name, surname, and age. We would say if length length of string is less than four, then nothing. Uh, else we do this, right? So we already have one level of nesting. Uh, by the way, can we return nothing? Yeah. 
Yes. We can return nothing because we have a return type maybe student. Perfect. So then uh, we would say, okay, we are good. We have four tokens, so let's parse them. We have params, which are our tokens, and then the param params zero is the name. No, it's the ID. So the name is this guy. So first let's check ID. So if, um, if valid, valid ID, uh, and then it's params zero, then if right, so if the ID is not valid, we want to shortcut again, right? So again, let's twist our um, our if statement, say, same as we're doing in Golang, and say if it's not valid ID, then we return nothing. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're checking for valid name. And you will observe that here we are kind of doing if not valid name, then nothing else if not valid surname. Params two, then nothing else if not valid. What was the last one? H. And that would be params three. Then nothing. And eventually we got to this else where we know everything is valid, right? So then we just say, yeah, finally we got the student. So we say just, and then we say student, and then we say params zero, params, params um, one. We kind of need the, I should have called it P, so much typing. Params two and params three. All right, so it doesn't have to have the syntax perfect, but the logic is correct. Do you think? Yeah. Yeah, we could use guards, but the guards are kind of not available in, in Golang and we wanted to have something which would kind of need to write in Golang, right? Um, so yes, we could use guards for those checks, for some of those checks, uh, but um, it would be kind of an equivalent of the if statements, which you have to use in Golang, right? The pattern here is again, is clear. We have, we are doing kind of different things, right? And you see we are doing uh, them multiple times here with this then nothing. And it's like a repetitive pattern, right? So, this is exactly the pattern which applicative functor captures, right? Applicative functor captures exactly that pattern. Uh, and the whole point of applicative functor is that you don't have to do that explicitly. It's kind of done by the pattern itself. Um, and the pattern is what we've been polishing and learning and kind of trying to get un under our skin is that to achieve exactly this, you would uh, want to convert those checks um, to a function which returns a maybe something, and then you can chain them by saying, I want to return a student, which is in fact a combination of, um, so I call them valid uh, ID. So, so we still need to do we still need to do this first check. So if if um is less than we return nothing else we 
we have do so so we cannot get rid of the first parsing part so for that part we ha still have to check for the number four because we're gonna pass those um parameters to our functions so then we're gonna say uh student and we're gonna wrap it with this valid id and the valid id function is gonna take uh params zero and it's gonna return a maybe id for us right uh if it if it returns nothing then this chain would kind of a shortcut here and it would return nothing so student would not be just student student would be nothing because one of those functions returns nothing right so instead of doing this kind of a nested repetitive uh if checks what we do is we do this instead um and we say um so we say valid id the second one is valid name and we pass params one and then we do valid surname name and we do params two and then we do the last one is id right so if you see code like this a repetitive code where you're kind of returning nothing because of kind of a shortcutting you can almost always turn this code into code like this which is so much nicer to deal with yeah H yes good good catch thanks so we have h as the last one so if we watch this code now um we can see that this code is much more modular it's much easier to read it's much easier to maintain it's much easier to check the validity of this code than kind of going yeah what are this like do have i missed not somewhere right if you miss this not the, the logic is wrong right uh here it's much difficult much more difficult to make errors right like you check this it's like yeah, you know looks good uh i don't have to be very specific like i'm not gonna miss a not in here uh and also this code renders itself much better for parametrization because suddenly adding parameters to my valid name is kind of much easier right so i can say i want a surname um to be uh two uh but uh, name to be length of two but surname to be length of four otherwise they are the same uh the same function right so i can say valid text length or length let's make it shorter right so now i can reuse the same function uh for both and if we kind of trying to do that we can also combine uh functions because now i can combine two functions together and i can check for length and for capitalization and i can make the code even more modular right uh because in here i'm checking uh like i'm repeating um if we if we parameterize this uh we make it monolithic because i cannot decouple checking for length and checking for capitalizations but if i have two functions one checks for length and one checks for capitalizations then i can compose it right and functional programming and our programming approach is to make things modular and composable such that if i can uh avoid checking for capitalizations i i don't but if i can i can just call this function if you have everything in a single function like this then it's kind of monolithic and mo modifying it's much much more tedious right uh so if you have let's say we have another uh you know our boss comes and says yeah we we have name and surname but we also need to have um tags for students and tags don't have requirement for capitalizations they are actually all lowercase right then you have to check for that and then checking for that is another block of of code and if you did this like here monolithic then you would be copy and pasting and removing some things right instead of composing functions so just kind of a heads up if you see pattern like this 
don't don't write this kind of a nested uh, if statements and kind of indentation going to hell. Rewrite it using applicative into something like this, right? Um, so that's the first thing. That that one is relatively straightforward. All you need to do is you need to turn uh, those functions for valid names and so on into maybes, right? Because all of this requires that valid ID, valid length, and valid age return maybe something. Uh, that's all. Um, and then it will nicely compose, right? So as I said uh, in Rust, we kind of have code like this because we use the question mark and we use this shortcut to kind of return a result. So if your function call returns a result, which is the same type as your actual calling function, then all you need to do is you have to add a question mark. And if this question returns the left side, if it, if it returns an error, then the code will stop here and it will jump out and it will return you this error to the caller, right? So Rust already has a mechanism to turn code like this into code like this, right? In specific circumstance. Golang doesn't have that. In Golang, you actually have to write code like this. In Golang, we write it the opposite way, right? So we say, um, if it's not valid, return an error, and then we don't have an else clause. And then you say, if the valid name is not valid, return an error, and so on, right? And at the end, you will kind of do this, right? So Golang code will look exactly like this, but without indentation. You just don't have the else, kind of you flatten the else. That, that's also a pattern. Um, if you can flatten the else, you should. So if every time in your code, if you have if statement, like in the imperative code, like in uh, C or C++ or Rust, if you have if something, do this else, do this. If you can remove the else, you should remove the else. You should kind of flatten the indentations. Um, so in, in Haskell, we cannot. We have to have both. We have to have then and else. Uh, but in, in uh, most programming languages, imperative programming languages, specifically in Golang, you can avoid else and you should. So you, you should not say, if my uh, database call is correct, do this with, the, with what I got, else there is an error, right? Because mentally it's much harder to keep track of your long method and then else, like what is else for, right? Uh, so what you should say is like, if my database call has an error, return the error. And there is no else. Then you go back to your context, and you say, "Oh yeah, now I'm in kind of a good context." Um, okay, so is that clear? I think this is relatively straightforward, and that's the beauty of of Haskell compositions because we can compose not just functions; we can compose applicatives, right? Uh, and this composition of applicatives removes this kind of a uh, boilerplate here. Okay, so I think this one is pretty straightforward and this one is pretty simple. The problem is that uh, that's not all we need to do. Uh, so in our case, um, we did that. Uh, let's, let me go to the maybe student, new maybe student. We basically did that here, right? We have a very easy to read implementation, a very nice and very maintainable. And we sort of did turned all those functions into maybe functions, right? So this is why for name, we have to say, uh, we actually don't check here. It, it's a, uh, the version without uh, error checking. So let me see. Yeah, we don't have the version anymore because I rewrote it to either. Um, okay, let me see if in the... Merge request one, I still have it. Uh, maybe I have it. Yeah, so this is this kind of a nested um, Tower of Doom. And then we have, no, I didn't. Yeah, so we kind of need to imagine that there are checks um, that we are doing for the maybe version. Uh, and those checks return maybe parameters, right? In our in, in my case, I'm not actually I'm I'm passing a parameter here, which is a string, but I need a maybe string. 
Um, so I'm converting it to maybe string by cheating and by saying pure, right? Ad otherwise, you would have to have this valid function here, which returns nothing if the string is not valid or string if it's valid, right? Because for name, we need a maybe string. So here we need maybe string. Here we need maybe number. Here we need maybe string. And here we need maybe number, right? Um, so this maybe number here is obtained by reading the um, the, the last parameter, uh, but I'm not doing any checks. So instead of just doing those things, uh, you would have to kind of, you know, uh, implement the function which does the reading and checking and then returns the, the thing. So this is the example of the code which works fine and returns as a maybe student. But the task is a little bit more difficult uh, because we want to return the error which happened, right? We need to know why we got nothing. So if you don't care, then this is fine. This is the simplest solution. But if you do care why you got nothing, you need to pass ad additional information, right? So what do we use in Haskell to pass additional information? Yeah, exactly. We pass either. And either is also an applicative. And either has the left and right side. And either composes exactly the same way as applicatives. Um, it's just that instead, like, you have, um, I don't have a pen here. Yeah, I don't have a pen. So um, I do have pens. So this is quite nice. Um, so normally we have, we have to do, we have to do something, then do something else, and then do something else. And then we have the final thing, right? Um, that's not good. You see it? So there are kind of, uh, you have some, some things you need to do. You're doing this, then this, then this, then this. And each step, the step may fail, right? And then if the step fails, if this step fails, we kind of go into the, into the nothing branch, right? So if this step failed and returned nothing, then we don't care. We go into nothing branch and then we return nothing, right? Uh, if all the steps co completed, then we, we return something. We return just, uh, just right? So it's the same with the with Golang. Like, if we're doing this, if there was an error, return an error. Otherwise, do this. If there was an error, return an error. But we have to do it explicitly, right? He, here it kind of uh, composes nicely. Um, So then um, this is with maybe. With either, we have a little bit more here. We have the left, left side, right? So left. If this one worked, then we have this. If this one worked, blah, 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 blah. And then we have right. So we have right side. Everything worked. We are on the right path. If something failed, we kind of are shortcutting to left, and then we're returning left something, right? Something. So here we have the ability to kind of a shortcut with additional context. With nothing, we have not, no, no context. It just kind of tells us, yeah, we kind of went to this uh, failure branch. But if we have left, then we can include additional context and we can uh, return it, right? So what we did, um, what we did later is we wrote our checks. We rewrote this, uh, and we have um, decided that we're gonna check, for example, for the length, and we're gonna return either there is an error or the the string was correct. We could. Um, uh, return arbitrary things on the left hand side, but there is a kind of a, a best the, the the a good approach is to define a type uh, which defines all the errors that can happen for you for the validation and then return the instance like a, a specific error that happened right um, and then the errors uh, you can see um, 
you don't see it, but what I did initially, I had uh, errors like this. I had errors like um, I show you. I had an error like um, error. You the prefix is just a convention because in IDE, if you start typing error, then it will show you kind of all the hints, right? So it's kind of nice to prefix it with something that makes sense for you to to work with. If you didn't have a prefix, then you need to remember all the names of your errors by heart, right? Um, it's a lot of typing. Maybe you should prefix it with error. So anyway, um, if you have error name too short, and I had error surname too short, right? And then I had um, error name not capitalized, and I had error surname not capitalized. And then I thought, shit, there is some repetitiveness of my errors, right? Uh, th 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 those two errors are kind of almost identical, right? And those two errors are almost identical. The only difference is, is it the name too short or surname too short, right? So then if you have a repetitive code, if you have to copy and paste, then you know you, you just have to abstract it away and have a parameter. Right, so that's what I actually did. Like initially I wrote all the errors like this and then I said, yeah, that kind of smells. So then I have um, I have error too short and it says, what was too short? Was it the name too short or was it the surname too short? You know, maybe in the future I will have tags and they may be too short so I can contextualize the error with additional information, right? Uh, instead of having errors like this. Um, so, that's what I kind of um, ended up refactoring it with. So then we have errors like this. It probably is a good idea to shorten it and say error. Uh, maybe I will. I would do that uh, if I refactor it again. And then you have some sort of a error handler. And the good thing, like I, we don't really need an error handler. We kind of we can show the errors because we derived the the show method. Uh, so we can say show. You know. But the point here is that um, you can handle errors uh, by saying what you want to do with a particular error, right? So what you can do is you can say, um, if you say error too short, and then you have some string, you can say do this. But if you have uh, handle error, um, error, error, not a number. Uh, does that one take? Uh, yeah, it takes a parameter as well. And then you can do something else, right? You can say this one is undefined. It throws, like it actually blows the program, right? It, it kills the program if I have this error. Um, and then if you do this and you try to compile, the compiler will tell you, hey, Marius, uh, your error handle doesn't handle all the errors. That's kind of a beauty of enforcing something by the types uh, because the compiler will know that I don't have an ex exhaustive pattern matching here. So it will tell me, Marius, error, handle error doesn't handle all the errors. You, you kind of need to implement the cases which you forgot about, right? So it will enforce certain things on you just by type checking, right? Um, so if you have implementation like this, it will say, yeah, uh, you know, you you don't have, you have missing cases, right? Uh, so then you can say, okay, I have missing cases, so I have to deal with them. And then, you know, you can say, yeah, for everything else, um, come on, for everything else, do something, do show, right? Um, uh, there is one annoying thing. Yeah, I would have to, I cannot use the uh, point three because I've already implemented um, the functions with the parameters. So if you try to do this, it will complain. It says, yeah, you need a parameter because you did use parameters before. So you kind of will have to do this. Um, there are some small annoying limitations of Haskell as well not as with other programming languages, but they are too. So th this one annoys me, right? So if you started implementing your function uh, with a certain number of parameters, then you cannot switch to point three suddenly, right? Um, okay, so that was a little bit of a detour about handling errors. Uh, we just 
have a default implementation and it works for everybody. And then um, I also have a default implementation for showing students because if I get an either student at the end, I want to either show the student or I want to show the errors, right? Uh, because we have this kind of a repo and we kind of saying a uh, new student. So then we want this. Okay, and then we basically have um, our new maybe student with errors. Um, yeah, so that's the one. So that's the implementation. And as you see, I'm again using this. Yeah. We can take a short break, sure. Yeah. So short break. So that that is um, those two two lines, uh, the kind of the happy happy line and the unhappy line. It's kind of the the highlight of monads and applicatives, um, how how they are actually working. All right. So uh, coming back to uh, to the either applicative we can see that we kind of doing the same thing here. Uh, and um, we have some, um, uh, let's say utility functions defined here in where. Uh, so we have a check, check number, which uh, is basically returning an error, um, uh, which says not a number and it says for what, because remember our types take parameters. So if we say uh, not a number, we have to say what was not a number. Uh, so for example, here we have error not a number and then we say what was wrong, like what was not a number. So here we passing, um, where is it? So that was maybe student. We have like we have a function check check is if something is a number, and then we pass the uh, the what the the kind of what we want to combine with the error, and we pass the string which is supposed to be the number, and then what we do is we basically do this um, check uh, on read maybe right. So we we uh, do read maybe on the string which is the second parameter uh, here. And then if the read maybe is correct, then we, we are passing it into a maybe function, which has the default value, which is this one. And the default one is an error, right? So the default value for our maybe is an error, which says return left side, error, not a number and what, what it is. So in our case, it will be not error, not number ID. But if this call doesn't return an error, it returns the actual value, then we call this function and return it with the value, which in our case is int. So then we return right int, right? So this is kind of a clever way of using a maybe function to avoid doing a case, because otherwise we would have to rewrite it something like this. We would have to say equals, um, case um, read maybe of string of, and then we have two cases, right? One case is that it's uh, left, no, it's nothing. So one case is it returns nothing. And then if it returns nothing, we want to return this error. So we would kind of uh, return that, right? So we'd say, yeah, uh, return, return that otherwise we are returning a maybe end right so here we would say just a number n and then what we want is return right n so instead of writing a case like this i mean you know if you look at the code is this code less or more readable than this one kind of the same maybe for you even this one is more readable right um, but in some more elaborate cases, you may prefer this maybe function. So this is a maybe function, which takes a default value 
if this one returns nothing and calls this function on the value which this one returns, right? Um, yep. Uh, how do you uh, return value? Just yeah, by magic. <laughs> how do you like, know that it is a validation or whatever? Uh, no, so in, in this case, it's just a single check. So we're only checking if it is a number. So we're passing it a string and saying, can you parse it into a number? And then if you can, return me the number, write number. If it's not, give me the error. Yeah, but... Uh... The problem here is that maybe read is not an either. It doesn't return an either, right? If it was returning an either, we could just compose it directly. We could just, like in our usage, we could just use it directly. But because this guy returns maybe, and we need either, we have to have this type conversion. Oh, you return both either. No, you, we have to return either. Yeah, but sure. but but read returns maybe. Yeah, so either is its own type. Yeah, either is its own type. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So here we're basically converting from maybe uh, nothing and just to left and right, right? Yeah. Can you have right? You can have right nothing, yes. Uh, so if your if your either is between uh, some validation error and maybe int, then you could return nothing. That's right. But then on the right hand side you would have to have maybe int, right? So, um, and sometimes you want that. Sometimes you want kind of this nested thing. In our case, we don't. We want to get an int such that we can compose the student because we want to pass an int into the student constructor, right? So yes, this is an equivalent code. I can leave it here. Um, the, the same code as above, right? All right, so this is the check number. And then when we actually constructing the student, we say uh, check a number with the error being ID. So it will be not a number ID and pass it the string, which is supposed to be a number. And we're gonna get either an error or a number. And because we are gonna get either an error or the number, we gonna, we, we can, um, use it in this chain of applicatives, right? Um, we're not doing the range check here, so I forgot to, to check for the range, but we have this case for multiple checks inside the name, right? So inside the name, we're doing a little bit of a trick because as you see, we have to do three checks. We have to check if the length is two, we have to check if the name is capitalized, and we have to check if the, we, the name contains only letters, right? Um, so, uh, let's quickly go to REPL. So if I have to, uh, if I have, um, so, so normally if we were to write it in, um, in a kind of, um, let's say, uh, imperative code, we would say if like we, we could compose those three functions, uh, but we would have to pass the parameter. Uh, and the other parameter uh, three times, right? So we could compose them by applicatives, but we would have to pass the parameter three times and then compose them three times, right? Um, but there is this kind of a neat trick. So if we go to, to REPL and I have, um, I have a number, let's say I have a number 100 and I have to add, um, I have to add something to it. Uh, so, so let's say we, we need to do this. I have a number 100, and then I have to add, uh, add 10 to it. I have to multiply it, uh, multiply by two, and um, subtract, uh, subtract 50, okay? So we, uh, we want to do three things on one single parameter that we are passing, right? So one way to do that is you would say a equals 100, um, what are we doing? Plus two, uh, plus 10, um, 
B equals uh, 100 times 2 or C equals 100 minus 50, right? But again, you see some repetitiveness, right? Uh, you kind of see this parameter is repeated three times and I'm kind of doing something on it, right? Um, so in Haskell, what you can do is you can say, okay, I have a uh, plus, I have a uh, multiply, and I have uh, subtract, okay? And I need to do this uh, on a parameter, which is 100. And I'm doing it with the right-hand side parameter, parameters, which in my case is um, 10, 2, and 50. Okay. So then if we do that, um, you see that I am constructing um, three functions with the parameter 100. So if, if we do that without the last part, um, I cannot print this in the in GHCI, but you kind of need to imagine that I have a list now of three functions and those functions are um, 100 plus, 100 multiply, and 100 minus, right? Yeah. Uh, in that case, if you practice uh, more character homework than the original thing, and the part is really Yep, you, you may kind of say that, but the, the whole point, like if you were to multiply the, uh, the two, if you were to do those three operations, you would write it like this, right? Yeah. That would be much simpler. Yeah. But sometimes it is actually simpler to do what that mechanism allows you to do, right? So let me let me finish this and then I will show you how I used it inside the, the code. So here you have three functions which are kind of waiting for a single parameter. And um, if you, um, so now if I compose A, I compose A with um, with a single parameter. So um, two, for example. Um, that doesn't work because this one is not an applicative then you're gonna get 100 plus two, 100 uh, multiplied by two and 100 minus two in kind of a, a single um, pattern matching uh, as a single list, right? So then what you can do is you can actually pattern match a prime, B prime and C prime and kind of do something like this. And then you have a prime and B prime, like what you wanted, right? So instead of doing three assignments in three lines like this, you can kind of uh, compose the operations and kind of do, do the pattern matching at the end to kind of extract what you really wanted. This becomes even more um, important if your numbers are not real numbers yet, right? So for example, imagine that I have, um, I have, I, I will shorten it to, to just two operations. So I have uh, just 10 and I have uh, just 20. So let's make it into a list. And now I will have um, this, um, let's say pure plus. And then we compose it with these guys and then we, um, again, I cannot print it. So if we check what is the type of A, then you say that I now have a list of functions which are from maybe A to maybe A, right? So now I kind of created a list of functions which are from a maybe A to maybe A uh, and then I can apply it um, 
to some maybe arguments because then I will get the, the results, right? So if I have A being those two functions, 10 and 20, and then I have another array of just 30, I can compose it with my A and then again, I'm getting lost with those. Uh... So then I have B is kind of a, a maybe A. Uh, so I have now a list of maybe A's, right? Um, and then what I want is I want those A's and I want to convert it. So I have a list of maybe A's and what I want is a maybe list of ints, right? So if one of the maybes is nothing, I'm going to get nothing. But if all of them were correct, if I was on a happy path and all of them gave me numbers, I want a list of those of those numbers. And that's where the um, this kind of um, a sequence sequence A operator is for. So sequence A um, kind of uh, traverses the list of maybes and says, if one of them was nothing, I will give you nothing. But if all of them were just, I will say just, and it will give me a, a list of um, of numbers. So yeah, I kind of got lost a little bit. So if I do sequence A of a list of just 10 and just 20, let's say we got this as a result, it will give me back just 10 and 20. So it will kind of uh, collapse all the inner kind of, you know, applicatives. And it will say it will return you an applicative of the inner values, right? Uh, and that's something useful um, because in our case, what we want is we want to check for the errors. And then we want to do that in kind of an extensible way. And we want to collapse it to a single uh, value, which says, was there an error or not? If there was an error, I'm going to get it. If there was no error, uh, I'm gonna get just the list of all the return types, right? So in our particular case, what I'm doing here is I'm constructing a list of functions that I want to call. All those functions gonna get a name as a parameter, right? So uh, I'm gonna say check length to name, and then all the functions are, are gonna get the second parameter, which is the actual parameter. Uh, for the for the functions. And then I'm going to get a list of either's and they will be either right or left, right? If they if one of them is left, the sequence will return a left for me. Um, if they were all right, the, the sequence will return a right of a sequence. And because each of this function is written in such a way that it returns the actual string, right? So uh, it, it doesn't return a bool, it returns a string, which is the string after the check. So it, it, in a sense, it's kind of pointless because I don't really care, right? Uh, if I'm checking, is this string a proper name, if, if, if it has a proper length and the function returns right this string, then I already have that string because I passed it to that function in the first place, right? So this is a little bit too much um, but I use this as a demonstration that you could do some processing here, right? So you, you may actually take a name, do something with it and return a, a modified value. And then all those functions will return you a modified value, right? Uh, in our case, in our case, all those functions return the same value, right? So in a sense, because I already have this parameter, because this parameter is here, I don't actually need it. Uh, I just need to know if um because you know th th this is kind of redundant i don't really need to do this this way what i can do is i can say write params uh params one right and in fact i don't really need all those checks to return anything on the right hand side i actually don't care about the right hand side so what i could rewrite them for i could say 
yeah if it's only letters re return me nothing like return me an empty tuple like i i don't care what you're gonna return on the right hand side because all i care is the left i all i care is errors if you return me to something on the right it means it was fine it, it's like a boolean check true right that the check passed right so i could rewrite it to this and it would work fine but um i kind of opted for the more complicated way of returning the same thing you see i'm passing it here and I'm returning it on the right hand side. So I'm kind of propagating it, right? So because I'm propagating it uh, in this function here, what I'm gonna get is a, a list of all the same strings, like four, uh, three times, right? The same string here, the same string here, the same string here. So I, I'm gonna get the list of, of, let's say, Alice three times and it passed. So uh, what I'm doing is like, I'm saying, yeah, just take the first one because all the other ones are the same, right? So I'm saying take the first one from the list and return it on the right hand side, right? Are you with me with this or not quite? <laughs> um, all right, so you, you can kind of study it a little bit at home, right? <laughs> what we'll stare at it a little bit and kind of a play with the plus and minus on the uh, GHCI and you kind of understand what sequence is doing here and why I comp compacted it into this notation. I You can unfold it, right? You can kind of say, all right, all right, let's, let's, don't, let's not be so fancy. Let's say name equals, and then you have to say, what is name equal to, right? Uh, so you would have to say, well, I have to do three checks. I have to check if the length of the name is correct, if the capitalized is correct, and if the other thing is correct, right? Uh, so you have to kind of build an expression here, which does three checks and gives you the, the thing that you need. So you probably want to write a function which does those three checks and returns you an either error or the, the thing, right? Um, and I, I am kind of doing it here as a kind of, it's not a one-liner, but it, as a kind of a expression, which I, it's more compact. Here you'd have to write a function uh, that uses uh, check length two, uh, check, check capitalized, and check only letters and returns either either error or string depending on the outcome of those three calls right you can try to com combine them you can try to com combine those three functions because those three functions also return an either. So you can actually use um, some notation to combine them. And that's what we're doing in the next example. So in the example of surname, we say, well, you know, those three functions, checking for length, checking for capitalized, and checking for only letters are actually monads, right? Because either is a monad. And then we have a fish operator, which allows you to compose monads together. And then you have this kind of a nice composition. So let's have a quick look what fish operator is like. So if we say, show me what fish is like. Okay, so fish is in the module called, um, so we say M plus control monad. So a fish operator is a very simple operator. It takes a function which takes a normal parameter and returns a monadic outcome. Another function which takes a normal parameter and returns a monadic outcome. And it creates a composition of those two. So the new function takes A and returns C, right? So this function takes A and returns B. This function takes B and returns C, but B and C are in monadic contexts. And this function is like clever enough to say, yeah, I get it. You give me an A, you give me a string, and I will return you an either a string or an error, right? And we have check for length, 
which takes a string, which is a normal string, and returns the either. We have check for um, capitalized, which takes a string and returns an either. And then we check for uh, what was the last one is all the characters are letters. So all of them fit that pattern, right? So because all of them fit that pattern, it's great because then I just use fish and say, yep, I have this one function which checks for length. I have this other function which checks for capitalized. They are composed into a single function with the fish. And then I have a third one, which is checking if the string has only letters. And again, I compose it with the fish. And then I ended up with a single function, which is which takes a string and returns me the either error or a string, right? Perfect, right? Why, why did I, I didn't use it here? Why I'm teaching you this ugliness here? Well, there is a reason. So this works perfectly fine. And then for the, for the age, I also use the fish. It's much nicer, right? I mean, using a fish composition of those three functions than this nonsense, right? It is nicer. That's why I use it here. So it works. You could decompose this fish because the fish is sort of like the monadic composition of functions. So you can kind of do it with do notation and do it like here. So I'm showing you how to do it for H because it only has two checks. So you can kind of do it like that explicitly, right? Uh, by passing it manually from function to function, right? Um, so uh, why do we do this? Any guesses? All right, so imagine, okay, so, so let's go, let's go to, um, let's go to our code. Let's quit that. I am in branch two. So let's say git check out Marius two. And let's say stack run. So I have some warnings because I have some things that I don't use. And then we have our beautiful REPL. So if I type some nonsense, it says, I don't know what you mean. If you type nothing, it just doesn't do anything. If you say new and you miss some parameters, it will say you don't have enough parameters, right? And then if I say new one Alice Cooper 23, all everything is clean. ID is okay. Name, surname is okay. Age is okay. I will get a student, right? But if I say new one Alice Cooper 199, then Alice is not capitalized. Cooper is not capitalized and the age is out of the range because we limited age to 130 years, right? So if I do that, I get a, an error and it says Alice is not capitalized, name is not capitalized, right? If I try new one A, C and B, again, I have three errors. I, I actually have a lot of errors. The name is not capitalized and the name is too short. Uh, C is not capitalized, it's too short, and B is not a number, right? And it's not in the range because it's not a number. But I'm, I'm gonna get, oh yeah, name is too short. I'm getting, I'm getting an, only one error, right? That, that's what we achieved. We achieved with left. Do you have a pen? <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. So hopefully the Zoom people also see the board. Yeah, so so here we said left. Perfect. And here we got into right. And right is a student. So this is this is not a problem. The, 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 the happy path, the happy path is still fine, right? Because we are returning right as student. The uh, the left part, the unhappy path. What's what's left returning? Left is returning an error, right? A validation, validation error. Singular. One. But we might have many, right? Um, 
So the unhappy path is okay with either because either works like that. Either returns a single left from those unhappy you know, occurrences. And this left, let, let's say we're doing this and there is a left um, and this left is the one which is being returned, right? We're not doing the rest. We're not kind of doing anything else because we kind of hit the unhappy path and that's what we return. That's how either works. And then that's how maybe works also. If maybe is doing multiple things and one of them hits the nothingness, then that's it. That you're gonna get nothing out of this composition, right? But what we want, we want something else. We want something which is if I quit that and if I go check up, check out branch three, and if I say run, uh, and if I say my new one A, B, and C, we want to get multiple errors, right? Um, so then I am getting multiple errors. And you would think, yeah, that, that's simple. Uh, instead of returning a left, instead of using either, so we have either, and we said uh, validation error and student, we just say, let's return a, a list of errors, right? Would that be great? And that would be great. But if you say either an array of errors and a student, unfortunately, um, that will still return you the first array the moment it hits the unhappy path, right? Uh, it will return you an array of an error, which is a single error, if you do that. We need a slightly different either. We need an either which accumulates the errors and combines them in a different way than either combines the errors, right? Yeah, I should not say right. <laughs> um, so that's what we did. We actually defined in here a new either for us, which is a, called validation. And it has a failure branch, which is the left branch, which takes a list of errors. And it has a success branch, which returns whatever the type is, right? I should not say right. Uh, it, it's called failure and success this time. So we could define it with, um, with validation A, uh, kind of an error type and A, a happy path type, but we kind of doing it for the purpose of this validation. So I can short it, shortcut it. So we could do it like this. We could say there is an error type um, like this, and then this would be a, a type constructor which takes two arguments the error type and the happy path type. Uh, but because I don't care about, like I want to simplify it, uh, then I can delete the that, part, that type and I can um, uh, hard code it here, right? So I, I kind of hard coded what the list is of, and then I only made it flexible here. Why did I make it flexible on the happy path? such that we can use it for students and we can use it for something else. But does it make sense? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe my validation, I, I don't need to parameterize it at all. Uh, maybe I, I kind of uh, only want to do it for a student. Could we do that? We could, it would work, but there is a catch. It would work, but I cannot make it into an applicative anymore. Because to make some type into an applicative, the type needs to have a kind, like it needs to take a, a single type parameter in the constructor. If it doesn't take a parameter in the constructor, I cannot make it into a functor and I cannot make it into an applicative. So I sort of need at least one parameter for my type constructor such that I can turn it into a, a um, Applicative and a functor. Why is that? Because when we say um, so, so remember, for example, for um, for applicative, I am able to do this, right? So I have my type, 
on the on this hand, hand side, but what I need on the left hand side. So, so my type with the value, let's say, is a type with a student, right? So I have a, uh, my signature is type of student, but if I have type of student here, th this doesn't make sense because I do need to have a function here. So I have to have kind of like a student to student or something like this, but this signature is not like this anymore. So that's why I need a generic type here such that I can stuff a, a function in, in, in my T. If I don't have this parameter, like if I, if I, if I have a, a fixed type, type of student, then I cannot kind of put a function into the place of a student. And I do need it for this to work because this means take a function from this T context and apply it to the value from the T context, right? Um, and that doesn't work if I cannot put a function in here. So to be able to put a function into my T context, I do need to have a generic type. I need to have a T of A, not T of student. Uh, so that's the uh, constraint that uh, when you want to make something into applicative, you have to use a generic type because at the end of the day, you should be able to put in a function in there. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, we have a generic validation type of A. Uh, we have a success uh, with, with this A, and then the failure branch is fixed. And then we define a semi-group. And that's the basically the, the fancy add-on of what we did. We basically said, if I'm combining two validations, which are errors, and we know the errors is the list, then the result is the concatenation of those two, right? So if I go, <clears throat> if I go to my uh, GHCI again, so we're gonna quit that, we go, to GHCI, and if I have a list, if I have a list of um, one, two, three, and I will combine it with 10, 20, 30, it will do what I expect. What, what would you ex expect? Yeah? One, two, three, 10, 20, 30. Exactly. So watch this. Now I have left. I have either a list. That's the no normal either, right? And the left hand side. Okay, let's do right first. So what what would you expect if you do this? The same, right? You would you you would kind of expect combination of both. No, you're not going to get it. The either doesn't kind of know that it's a list. It knows it's a thing, but it doesn't know it can kind of combine it like this. Either assumes it's a single thing. So if you have right and right, it kind of returns you the first one. Same as if you have right, uh, left and left. So if I do the left, lefts now. Um, so if you do left, left. It returns you the, the second one, right? Just work, yeah, so with just, it will work. You're right. So if we combine just with the maybe um, semi group, so if you say just has two lists and I'm combining two justs, you're going to get what you expect. So it's a little bit strange, but it's a little bit up to the implementation. And what we did, we did our own implementation, in which case, if I have a failure, a failure, then it would combine them. That's what we kind of defined here. We said, well, if you get two things on the failure side, I just concatenate them, right? That, that's all we really changed that it behaves kind of like a just for maybes, that it combines the lists together. And then the rest we kind of need because um, 
uh, we want this to be also like an applicative and a functor such that we can use all those com uh, combinators uh, that we used before. But we implement them in a very standard way, right? So all those implementations are as you would imagine, apart from this one. If you combine two failures, we using our redefined semi-group, um, the, the same way as we kind of did for the... Um, for the F and for the G, um, you could you could say you're gonna concatenate here as well, but yeah, it's kind of a more fancy to do that. So then, to be able to use this fish operator, uh, we have to use uh, we have to define a bind. So I'm not defining a fish, but I'm defining a bind, and then fish is defined using the bind. So it will work automatically as well. Uh, and then what we can do is we can do all the things that we did before. So we can do the fish and we can do the fancy uh, applicative notation here. So the code is exactly the same. This function doesn't change anything. It works exactly the same way, but now it combines the error, but only for this case, because how you like if, if you watch the implementation for the fish, um, if I have um, yeah, so for the applicatives, it works because it combines the errors. But for the fish, uh, if I have a failure and it's bind to something, how I'm gonna propagate the result of the calling of the function in here such that I extract the second error. I don't, I don't have access to that because the second parameter to F is a function. So here is a function which takes a normal value and returns me a monadic context, right? So I, I, the only thing I can return is the first error. So we back to the limitation of what we had with the either such that if I'm using the fish, I'm actually stuck with the first error. Um, so the name is handled with applicatives, with, with this, and with the sequencing. The surname is uh, dealt with the fish. So if, you, if we go back to, to the, um, if we go back here, observe this. I will say new one, the name has three errors, okay. It has three errors. It's two. No, I cannot have three errors uh, because if it's if it's <laughs> um, okay, okay. Let's let's do it. So I will say it now. It has three errors. Um, new. Okay, ID is okay. The name has three errors because it contains not letters. It's too short and it's not capitalized. Hopefully, I I don't know if two is capitalized or not actually. Uh, and then the surname is the same. It's too short, blah, 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 blah. And then the, uh, the age, let's say the age is fine. So I get for name, I get it's too short. It's not capitalized. And it it's, I got all three errors for the name. But for surname, I only got one error, right? So you see that our very nice notation with fish kind of doesn't allow us to collect all the errors. It will work, it compiles, it works fine, but it only gives you the first error. It kind of gives you the error for this, that it's too short. And then, so if you want to collect all the errors, somehow you do need to collect them all. And one way of collecting them is this one, uh, which is the manual way of collecting all the errors by sequencing the executions. But you can also do the same if you combine all those calls using the um, somehow combining the function calls together. But that is the limitation of the applicative. In the applicative, you cannot really do that. You cannot compose applicative calls um, like one after the other. You can, com like you can create one long applicative call uh, from a, a simpler ones, but you cannot pass one parameter from a call to the next one, right? 
So we kind of need to think how this can be done nicer, but this will not work if we want to collect all the errors. All right, so that's it. Um, it has been a little bit hard, I guess, uh, and you do need to stare a little bit into the code. So let me know what you think, and we kind of uh, discuss it a little bit more on, on Thursday. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks.